high-risk myeloma is a term, or nowadays we use ultra-high-risk myeloma even, um, to describe the patients that with current standard of care treatment do unfortunately encounter an early relapse. And because uh, in younger patients we use very standardized treatments with an upfront induction therapy, transplant, and then maintenance therapy, that's often the, um, the, the, the kind of treatment that we use to define who is relapsing early or not. Because there's about 20-25% of patients who relapse with the disease within two years uh, after the transplant. And we know that these patients unfortunately have a, a very unfortunate outcome afterwards. The problem is that the disease is really difficult with current treatments to bring into a good remission again and the remission again that uh, is, is, is kept there. So we have done over a long time gone and many groups um, um, in terms of trying to find genetic markers that can help us identify these patients before they even start their very first treatments at the very, very diagnosis of myeloma. And we have made um, big um, progress there. So we can identify patients now on the means of genetics in terms of co-occurrence of two or more high-risk markers or double hit. Uh, or uh, by means of gene expression profiling, uh, which shows us a, a gene expression high-risk signature. So the OptumMark9 trial is a trial that we designed about seven years ago, when we saw uh, that these genetic markers can help us, um, uh, that genetic markers and gene expression markers can help us identify patients with high-risk disease, so patients who have a high risk of their disease coming back within two years, particularly with the current standard of care maintenance treatment with lenalidomide. So we designed a trial um, whereby we screened everyone for these genetic markers. At the time uh, in the UK, these were not standard of care uh, everywhere, so not every patient could access them. So we asked for a sample centrally where we did molecular profiling for two or more genetic high-risk markers, uh, as well as for gene expression profiling. And if any of the two was positive, the patient was given the option to say, I want to take part in this trial. And our thinking was that um, the treatment has to particularly be improved both at the beginning, but particularly the ma maintenance therapy has to be improved. So we actually used 18 months of a three drug combination maintenance therapy, and then they uh, move all on to Daralen maintenance therapy. And this concept <clears throat> was actually highly successful. We compared the outcomes against the patients that we enrolled in the previous trial with the same molecular features. Uh, and the outcome was uh, um, multiple times better. So the progression-free survival, instead of being below 40% in the new treatment regimen, was uh, 77%. Uh, the outcomes are so good that we're even now taking the results forward uh, to a commissioning application to see whether we can potentially get reimbursement for this treatment in our healthcare system. So although we have made big progress with uh, Optimum Mark 9 and really many patients are still in a remission now that would normally have relapsed uh, due to their aggressive disease, we did nevertheless see that 20% of patients, even with this currently best treatment that we could think of, uh, relapsed with their disease. So we wanted to learn more about who are these patients. And I think in this case, it came as an absolute advantage that we had done so much effort on doing the genetic profiling and the gene expression profiling, because we could now look at whether any of these genetic or gene expression markers were more likely uh, to be linked to an early relapse. So we identified particularly uh, patients that had three high-risk markers co-occurring, as well as a slight trend towards those that have a gene expression high-risk signature or, and or plasma cell leukemia to have uh, an early relapse within these first 18 months of treatment, despite the very good treatment. So the, uh, as much as that's of course as such a, a sad finding, I think it nevertheless gives us the hope that we can use these diagnostic tools uh, in the future to identify these patients early to really try new treatment approaches such as bispecific antibodies or CAR T cells. So uh, we have several ways of identifying patients with high-risk myeloma, either through genetic profiling. This uses the DNA of the cell, which is, which is the inherited information normally that is present in every cell, but in the tumor cell, it has really gone through a lot of changes, a lot of mutations. And we have identified several uh, mutations that are linked with a shorter survival. Now, on their own, they're not very powerful, and with new treatments, we actually can overcome some of them. 
But when two or more of these uh, markers co-occur, unfortunately, we do know that the disease is more aggressive, seems to be more resilient against treatment and find ways around treatment more easily. And that is actually true. The more of these risk factors are present, the more aggressive a tumor unfortunately becomes. So for example, uh, recall those with two markers double hit and those with three triple hit, there can even be four co-occurring markers in forms of quadruple hit. Um, there is also another way of looking at um, the aggressiveness of the cell that has not to do with the uh, DNA, but with the RNA. The RNA is kind of like the, the living library. It's a, it's, a, it's a status of how the cell is behaving at that very moment. Uh, and uh, we know that RNA and gene expression profiling, which you use to identify the RNAs that are present in a cell, can tell us something about how the cell is behaving and doing in this moment. And there are signatures that have been identified, so effectively a combination of genes when they're expressed uh, that can tell us that the cell is more aggressive than another one. And particularly, we have found that many of these genes have to do with how quickly these cells can divide, how quickly they can multiply. And this is a different type of information than the genetics. So you can not get the full picture with either the one or the other test. It's actually really combining the two tests where you get the, the, the most power of of giving the patient a very precise diagnosis about their current disease. So I think uh, the results from the OptumMark9 trial, for example, and this has been fortunately shown in similar trials, like the CONCEPT trial or here the IFM 2018 trial were presented as well, we know now that probably for three quarters of patients with ultra high disease, we can offer really good treatment, much better treatment than we could offer before through combined induction therapy, four or five drugs with the CD38 antibody, but particularly by improving the consolidation and maintenance therapy. However, we still see that there is a quarter of patients or 20% of patients that do, even with such treatments, have very aggressive disease and early relapse. And I think this is a very strong signal. Both of these findings mean, A, we should really, really work very hard and jointly together to offer better diagnostics for patients. If you don't know about these markers, you will never know how to identify these patients. And of course, this is often uh, a, a different access in different countries. So it's, it's very clear that there is also money involved. So there has to be really a very clear strategy in the community moving forward that we really try to make it as equal as possible, the access. But I think what it also tells us that we still identify patients that need or, or could really be considered for yet new trials, new approaches with new treatments coming on we always have the choice whether we recommend to a patient maybe a more risky but very novel treatment. And I think with better diagnostics, we can have a much better in, uh, communication and discussion with the patient about whether to take part in the trial, for example. So um, we have seen an improvement of the outcome of patients with high risk and ultra high patient already by the current treatments that we have, by mostly by combining. Uh, several different agents together, we realized that the joint effect on these aggressive cells is better when we attack it from different sides. Of course, what we have with that also bought is that the patient needs more treatment. Ideally, of course, we would want to have a treatment that really, really goes to the source, to the reason why these cells are more aggressive. And these are tools that we're lacking at the moment. There are very uh, promising new developments about, for example, new drugs that are targeting the product of the T414 translocation, uh, which is called NST2. And if these inhibitors are successful, they could potentially offer hope for patients with this type of high-risk disease. Uh, another option is, of course, that we have more powerful drugs in itself, in themselves, such as, for example, we now see bispecific antibodies as a single therapy already having higher response rates than even if we combine three drugs before. And it's going to be a lot about finding out how these drugs work in ultra-high-risk disease uh, and how we can use them best to benefit our patients.